so famous? Director of movies, Sixth Sense. Sixth Sense. Who said Sixth Sense? Yeah, you got a good catch. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know how I'm going to keep it. I'm going to keep it here, just collect okay. it on the ground, okay? All right, <laughs> let me show you. This, this is what he made. This is how he became famous. He made this famous movie called Sixth Sense. And uh, Bruce Willis is a ghost who talks to people or something like that. Uh, both my wife and my daughter say he's awful. <laughs> because he ruined the movie called The Airbender. But nonetheless, the other movies, The Village and The Sixth Sense, were really extraordinary films. He was born in a small town called Pondicherry. It is a French colony in South India. And then he grew up in Philadelphia. He is a writer, director, producer, and he shoots all his films in Philly or around Philly. That's, that's an interesting part about Mr. Shaman. Okay, this should be easy. Anybody knows who this guy is? He made a lot of fun of Delaware. John Stewart. <laughs> no, no, it's not me. I'm not that famous. No? Oh my God! John Stewart's. Uh... Yeah, you're close. <laughs> I want his name. <laughs> no? Okay. You should watch the Daily Show. This is Asif Manu. Asif Manvi was born in Mumbai in 1966. He's also a movie star. He was the bad guy in The Airbender that Matt Shyamalan made. He, he made a very interesting movie that just came out. It's called something to do with cooking. Something. Yeah. Uh, yeah. What's today's special? Yes. What's today's special? It's a very nice movie. If you have Netflix, you should watch it. But he's also a, a very funny guy. He's a reporter on. The reason why I'm picking these Asian Americans is for immigrants. The ultimate test of how well you are integrated is how often you show up in comedies and culture. That is the test. If you are an expert biologist and you get a job in the US and teach biology at the University of Delaware, that's not a big deal. To be part of the comedy, to be part of the culture, that is the measure of and that's why people like Asif Manvi and Mike Knight Shyamalan are important because they are uh, barometers of the extent to which Asian Americans have become a part of American culture. Now you cannot watch a mainstream show now without at least one Indian on it. For example, if you, I can go on with all the show, but next time you watch a TV show, notice that an Asian American is like a mandatory now. All right, let's see if you can recognize this one. <laughs> okay. South Carolina. Yes, you got the answer here. Khaled, I will take you. I know you know all of that. So you have to pick a book. I said one book for us, it's Manvi. So you also said the governor. So I will give it to you. She's Nikki Haley. She's the youngest current governor in the United States. She's the governor of South Carolina. She's the first female governor of South Carolina. That's a huge achievement, believe me. If you have driven through South Carolina, you will be able to understand what I mean by that. She comes from a province called Punjab in India. Can you tell me who this guy is? Uh, I don't think so. <laughs> You're not <laughs> No. <laughs> I wanted to read two books if somehow. He bought Jacks for Jaguar. Yes, yes. This guy is a Pakistani American called Shahid Khan. He's a bumper billionaire. You know what a bumper billionaire? Yeah, yeah. All the bumpers of Toyota yeah, are manufactured by him. Oh. And uh, he bought the Jacksonville Jaguars for $750 million. He is one of the two or three Pakistani American billionaires in the US. You need to hit him for funding. <laughs> he needs to be on our board. There's a lot of money to burn. <laughs> Okay, that's right. You know who this guy is? Governor of Louisiana. Governor of Louisiana. Okay, I will give two books. The past is mine, you can also do one year or one year. Okay, all right. Until Nikki got elected, he was the youngest governor of the US. You know, what are the odds? You know, they both come, their parents of both these people come from the same neighborhood, within 25 miles of each other from Punjab in India. It's amazing, isn't it? They're both, both Nikki Haley's parents 
and Bobby Jindal's parents, they both come from Punjab from the same area, a little further from a place called Ambala. It's quite possible that he could be, if not this time, the next time, the vice presidential candidate for the Republican Party. You know who this guy is? Chopra. Yeah. Deepak Chopra. <laughs> you get it? All right. Deepak Chopra. You know, and he's one of those pundits. This is very important because now we got an Indian guru, we thought that Bhagwan Rajneesh, uh, who is telling. He's like the Dr. Phil, you know? So, an Indian Dr. Phil. He was born in Delhi. So far, you're doing pretty fine. You know who this woman is? She's married now with a baby. Come on, Khaled, this one you have to get. Her mother is from our hometown. Her mother is from my hometown, but she changed her nationality. Okay, she is Oma Abidin. She's a Pakistani American. She is the chief of staff of Hillary Clinton. She may not be the highest ranked Muslim in the U.S. government today, but she's definitely the most influential and most powerful Muslim in the U.S. government today because of her proximity to the Clintons. She's very close to Hillary Clinton. She's like a body double 24 hours a day for the last uh, 15 years or so. Not in the news much. Yeah, she wasn't in the news Being for unfortunate crazy. reasons. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, her husband was yes, yes, yes. Mr. Yeah, Wiener, the congressman. That was bad news. Oh, yeah. oh, now you know. <laughs> like, but what was also interesting is that there are, there are lots of interesting rumors about this, but nonetheless, Uma Ahmedin is very influential. Her mother teaches in Saudi Arabia, Jeddah, for the last 20, 25 years. And it's an academic journal. She's a professor. And she was born in Pakistan, and she came to the U.S., studied, I think, at Vassar, and that's how she knows the great people. You know this guy? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh, right. oh, seems like you're in other books now. You know who this guy is? <laughs> this guy, well, after the World Trade Center collapse, which, which building became the tallest building in the U.S.? The Sears Tower, right? Well, he's the guy who designed the Sears Trump. His name is Faltur Rahman Khan. He's a Bangladeshi American. He was known as the Einstein of Structural Engineering. You know, the, the buildings move. Yeah. All the high tower. Yeah. That was yeah. his idea that we need to make buildings flexible. And that's why, because of the flexibility of the structures that he came up with in the 60s and 70s, that we are able to build buildings that are so high today. So he's considered as the father of structural, as uh, Einstein of structural engineering. All right, now we, let me talk to you about South Asia. This is South Asia. There are two maps of South Asia, as you can see. The first map is what, what we call as, this is India's map of South Asia, and this is Pakistan's map of South Asia. Can you tell the difference? Kashmir. Yeah, the difference is Kashmir. Look at this little thingy, hooky. Pakistan claims this part of Kashmir is part of Pakistan. <coughs> India claims the same thing is part of India. But this is South Asia. South Asia includes Afghanistan, Pakistan, India, Bangladesh, uh, Bhutan, Nepal, Sri Lanka, and Maldives. Myanmar is not included in South Asia. When I teach South Asia, I also <coughs> include Canada. Just a matter of time. <laughs> Canada will be part of South Asia. <laughs> and and uh, the difference is, uh, this is the key issue. This is the biggest fault line in South Asia. It is the dispute over Kashmir. One of the reasons why South Asia is not as prosperous, as influential, as developed as it ought to be is because of the Kashmir dispute. Countries, both India and Pakistan, have been wasting literally billions of dollars. Pakistan now spends close to 40 to 50 percent of its national budget on defense, and India also spends about 16 percent on defense because of the Kashmir dispute. To get an idea, at the peak of U.S. response to 9/11, we have at the most reached six and a half percent. The U.S. has never spent more than six and a half percent of its budget on defense. So you can imagine what a big shock it must be. Every time that the country just spends 40 to 50 percent 
just on the military. So there's very little left. So sometimes you have less than 3% left for developmental efforts. I don't know, for example, in the US, we spend nearly one third on Medicare and healthcare and social security, etc. But we have a lot of money still left to give away to rich people on Wall Street for making errors, etc. But we also have money left for education, for healthcare, so on and so forth. So countries which have not been involved in military conflicts and which have been able to spend at least 15 to 20 percent of their national income every year on development have made significant transitions from underdeveloped and poor to middle income and large income countries. The one reason why there's rampant poverty in these countries is because they spend a lot of money on defense and very little on basic health care, education, etc. This is the bone of contention in the region. This is the tip of Kashmir. This yellow is how India perceives it. This is the part of Kashmir which is part of China, and this is the part of Kashmir which is part of Pakistan. India wants this, this green part, Pakistan wants this part. For some reason, no one is messing with China. <laughs> I actually found very interesting that there's a big mountain range here. So India actually has zero access to outside chain. Even if they, China gave it to them, they would probably not be able to even reach it. So in 1950s, early 50s, China built a highway through Aksai Chin to Pakistan. And it's about 1,500 kilometers. And India didn't even know it for seven years. India learned about it in 1958 when the Chinese drew their new maps. And they said, what, what is this line through Kashmir? And they found out that it was a highway. And then they fought in 62. But what is interesting is that as far as India and China are concerned, the border dispute is settled. And what India and China have agreed upon is to accept what is called as line of actual control. So they have accepted the line of actual control, the LOC, and they have actually signed documents to that extent. This is the line of actual control between India and Pakistan, and they are fighting over it. That is the only solution to this region. The whole idea of making this region independent or giving this to Pakistan or giving this to India is not really going to work. For example, if Pakistan actually offered this region to India now, it comes with certain kind of people that India may not want. They're creating a lot of problems in Pakistan. Let them be there. The Taliban, the Lashkar al-Taiba, all these kind of groups. Why would you want millions of them inside your border? So people would want land without people. It's a very funny kind of an exchange which leads to ethnic cleansing, etc. So the only logical discussion is the line of actual control. I was part of these discussions in the early 2000s. And uh, I was actually translating stuff that for Bill Clinton with the leader of the Pakistani Jamaat Islami and a leader from the Indian side of Kashmir. And the logical discussion was, yes, we should accept line of actual control and move on forward. But they were not willing to come out and publicly make those commitments. And so Clinton Hafid who said, look, if you can't say these things publicly, why should I waste my time? talking about this behind the scenes. And so he, he didn't like the behind the scenes diplomacy because even if there was an agreement, people who signed these documents, they're afraid to talk to their own people and there was no point of legitimizing these pieces. So this remains a major issue and as long as this issue remains, there are human rights issues involved and every time India wants a major position such as a Security Council, Permanent Security Council position, uh, or the right to veto the whole issue of human rights in Kashmir will come up. India has nearly a million soldiers, an army of one million people literally occupying Kashmir since 1948. So, so it's a big issue for Pakistan. The pursuit of Kashmir has literally, in my opinion, ruined the country. They spend more money on trying to get Kashmir than anything else. And after the creation of nuclear weapons, conventional wars became irrelevant. After the war of 1971, Pakistan realized that it could never win a military contest with India, and so it resolved to non-military violence, which is terrorism, and you're seeing the consequences of terrorism on both sides of the border. Just in 2011, 1,750 people were killed in Karachi alone. And till now, in 2012, 400 people have been killed in the city of Karachi alone, way more than in the last 16 months, more people have been killed in the city of Karachi than in India in the last 10 years through terrorism. 
So that's an issue that these countries need to resolve. The U.S. has always played a back seat on this issue, has never taken a lead position, not like we have played a role, at least in the, in the failed attempt to bring peace uh, to the Arab-Israeli conflict. But the U.S. has played a significant role in the, in the Korean conflict, in, in, in the Irish conflict, but not in the South Asian conflict. And increasingly, with the growing power of India and the influence of India in the U.S., I think the U.S. role in mediating these kind of conflict is going to become more and more diminished. It's not going to increase the ability of the U.S. Uh, to, to influence at least India, but it will become less. And given the rising hostility between Pakistan and India, there again the U.S. ability to influence Pakistan again becomes diminished. So therefore the U.S. now is less able to influence any political solution or broker a political solution in the region. I, I, I used to write about it five, six years ago, seven years ago, I got involved and then I completely gave it up because I thought I would be wasting my entire life on this issue because I don't think it is. It is much, much more intractable than, than uh, the Arab-Israeli conflict. I think there is a higher probability of resolving even the Jerusalem issue than the Kashmir issue in my opinion, unless there are significant changes on the ground. And, that means that one side has to lose the war decisively. Uh, that is probably what might eventually happen in the long run. Okay, this is South Asia. And I'm going to make a very provocative proposition to you that Europe was America's past, but South Asia is going to be America's future in many ways. Uh, but when I'm making this statement, I want to include China part of it. That's why I'm calling Chindia. China and India are going to be the future of this country. China is going to be ultimately our biggest trading partners both ways, in terms of buying from us and selling to us. China will become the biggest, uh, what do you call it, debtor? No, not debtor, creditor nation to the US. Uh, in terms, of the reason why China is already not a major creditor country is because England has been investing in this country for the last 215 years. That's why historically, uh, the British people and the British government and British institutions hold 26% of all foreign investments in the U.S. They own things like ranches in Texas, hotels in New York, and stuff like that. And that's because of the traditional relationship. But in the last 10 years, India and China have been the biggest investors in the U.S. and also the biggest creditors to the U.S. And that is going to, uh, as an aside, India this year has become the third largest economy in the world. So now the biggest economy in the world is the U.S., followed by China, followed by India. This is in what we call as purchasing power parity. I don't know whether you understand what that means. Purchasing power parity means that you make adjustment for the fact that uh, a loaf of bread in India would cost you five cents as opposed to say one dollar in the US. So when you make those kind of cost of living adjustments, it's like when you when you get two jobs. If you get $60,000 job in Delaware and $120,000 job in New York, which one would you take? You know, when you make the, I would take the $60,000 job in Delaware anyway. No taxes, and no tolls. You take a wrong turn and you end up spending $100. <laughs> so, so, so you make that kind of adjustment is the third largest. Otherwise, it's the ninth largest country. But what is also interesting is that there is a significant transformation taking place in the diasporas of China and, and India in the US. A friend of mine did his dissertation at Brown University, and he came up with a distinction between what he calls as simple conflict and complex conflict. And he compared the conflict between India and Pakistan and India and China, and actually made a successful argument that the conflict between India and Pakistan is simple, and the conflict between China and India is complex. And the example that he gave was that, look, in America, all Desi events, as we call it, South Asian events, uh, South Asia, the world become very popular because of the intermingling of Pakistanis and Americans in the, and Indians in the U.S. Festivals we share, we have the same music, we have the same food, we have restaurants. All the Indian restaurants that you see in Delaware or either Pakistani or Bangladeshi, 
Sizzler, India Sizzler on Main Street is actually owned and run by a Bangladeshi family. So, so there are these nebulous mixings. So South Asia is a much better academic term to talk about the South Asian diaspora really in the US. So while there may be conflict in India and Pakistan over Kashmir and hostility towards perceptions on religious issues, they don't, there is no conflict here between Indians and Pakistanis in the US. The worst thing that you see is a cricket match once in a while where you actually, are, if you are able to put together an India 11 and a Pakistan 11, which usually never happens. But the Chinese and the Indians have a much, much more intense conflict. For example, if you are an engineer, like when I went to an engineering college in India, my biggest competitors were Chinese. Because I was applying to MIT and etc. So for funding to graduate schools and PhD programs in technology, India's biggest competitors are Chinese. It's not where the competition ends. Once you finish that, the next round of competition is at venture capitalist doors in Silicon Valley. And so on. So the Chinese are part of the Google cloud, the Indians are part of the Hotmail cloud, and so on and so forth. So there is an intense conflict which is taking place in the battlefield of technology and business yeah, incredibly. Uh, last summer I was in Morocco and uh, I, was had, I was scheduled to have lunch with the Indian ambassador to Morocco. He calls me an hour before the lunch and says, Muftada, is it okay if I bring a friend? I said, sure, go ahead. There's nothing official about this meeting. And the friend that he brought was the Chinese ambassador to, to Morocco. So over lunch I started sort of teasing them and I said, this must be a great job. All you guys must be doing is going to the baths, you know, the Turkish hamaks and getting massages. And I said, what, what, work the, what work do you have in this part of the region? The Chinese ambassador actually got offended. I said, just play golf and that's all you guys do here. He said, no, no, that was the case till last year. I said, really? What changed? He said, well, last year, last year, there were only 20 Chinese in the whole of Morocco. And I said, what happened now? He said, now there are nearly 4,000. And these are not ordinary Chinese, these are CEOs and extremely rich corporate guys. And if I don't answer their phone, the Prime Minister will call me. Those kind of people are here. Because China is buying everything in West Africa and the base is for that. They're buying all mines. Any kind of mine. If you just tell the Chinese, I dug a hole and something came out, they'll say, we'll buy it. You don't, you don't even have to tell them what's coming out. Now India is lagging behind by six months. And so the first thing that at that time the Indian ambassador was doing was to buy a big new building to have a massive Indian embassy in Rabat, Morocco, because they are going to compete on each and every mine that the Chinese are going to bid for, you'll have Indian businessmen bidding. So it's a very intense conflict going on in South Asia. The third party in every conflict is the US, either as a partner of one or the other side, as an intermediary, or as a competitor. And that's going to be the scene in the next 20, 30 years. The battles are going to be fought in the corporate world. There is going to be a gradual transition of power from the U.S. to China. As Henry Kissinger says, this has to be managed. And How about the Europeans? To... Oh, they are finished. <laughs> they are <laughs> They're done. Europe is done for the next hundred years. They're going to go like Greece, take my word on that. So it's, this is the three countries, U.S., China, and India. Even Japan is not very... Japan has been in recession since 1990 zero growth rates, zero interest rates for nearly 22 years. It's not going anywhere. So this is an important thing. That is why, for example, now we have a Confucian Center at University of Delaware, funded by the Chinese. More and more people are going to start learning Chinese and they're going to study Chinese, they're going to go to China. China was always fascinating for Americans. I don't know, but Americans have been doing business in China since the mid mid 19th, 19th, 18th century, 19th century. You know, this whole idea that there are a billion people there, and if I can make a pen, and if every Chinese buys my pen, I will be a billionaire. This whole idea of the population of China has always been appealing to Western business. So that is the future. But what is also interesting is that those two countries will continue to have tremendous leverage in the US. We have 50 states, two are governed by Indians already. That's a leverage. And I, I, I can go down the litany of all the Indians. The last, I mean, in the last 10 years, four Indians have won Nobel Prizes in the US. The Dean of Harvard Business School is from India. The Dean of Stanford is from China. 
World Bank guy we are calling the South Asian. So, so there is going to be tremendous domination. Like even in Delaware, I don't know whether you're following these charter school fights that we are going on. New York charters, expansion, Wilmington charter. There's a fight about how charter schools are leading to racial segregation. The percentage of Asians in Delaware is 4%. Whereas in Wilmington Charter, it's 26%. And it's 19% in Newark Charter. That will tell you how Asians will be competing on, on, the, on the culture of meritocracy in, in a big way for the next at least foreseeable future. We are talking about 20 to 30 years. This is South Asia in a nutshell. Look at the population, nearly 1.75 billion. Roughly one out of four people in the world are South Asians. So if you have four kids, you can make them Mark, Jack, Jill, and either Muhammad or Ram. Because every fourth person in the world is a South Asian now. Because of the population, 1.75 billion to the population of 7 billion. What you see here are economies. The growth rate, you look at Bangladesh, one of the poorest countries, but still averaging 5.5% in this decade and 6.4% this year. This is India averaging 8, 10.2% this year. Pakistan is having the worst year since 1998. Otherwise, if you take off 1998 and you take off the last two years, even Pakistan has been averaging over 6.5% growth rates. Can you imagine if they were not involved in a conflict, these growth rates would have translated. I went and read books in the 1950s when people started using the word Asian tiger the first time. Do you know who they were talking They were talking about three Asian tigers throughout the 1950s, and they were Egypt, Pakistan, and Japan. And then by the time we went into the 60s and 70s, Japan had become Japan. And then Asian tigers were basically Taiwan and Hong Kong. And now it's Malaysia and Indonesia and others. Pakistan and Egypt have completely fallen off the cliff, so to speak. But nevertheless, they have made gain. For example, Bangladesh <coughs> has busted many notions of Western political science. Throughout the 60s, 50s, 70s, 80s, the political scientists in the West believed that democracy was a dividend of capitalism, especially during the Cold War. They argued that without capitalism, you could not have democracy because it was prosperity which made people to demand rights. But Bangladesh is a very interesting country, one of the poorest countries in the world, which reversed the whole idea and saying, no, we will have democracy first. We may or may not ever become really prosperous, like the West talks about. So they constitutionally, they are liberal democracy. And liberal democracy is wary in their performance in terms of how, to what extent they can protect the rights of minorities and provide freedom to their population. But in de jure terms, it is a liberal democracy, which is reverse of the notion that democracy is the fruit of prosperity. And, and so it's a very interesting development in South Asia. Now, the region has immense potential, but it also has immense challenges. If I was teaching a, a senior level course at the University of Delaware, this is the slide that you would really concentrate on. And I want to take a look. These are basically the, 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 the assets of the region, and these are uh, the, what would be the opposite of liabilities of the region? The most important thing is human resources. India has 1.2 billion people. By 2020, India will be the world's biggest country with 1.64 billion population. 1.64 is the forecast for India's population. That's where it's going to taper off. Maybe by 2030, maybe by 2040, but at 1.65 it will taper off. China by that time would have reduced to about 115. 1 billion, 150 million, 115. Pakistan is actually predicted. The forecast is that Pakistan, which is now about 170 to 180 million, will be 500 million by 2050. It will triple its population in the next 38 years. It's amazing. I, 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 when I saw the stats, I thought I, I, I was doing this forecasting the population for Pew studies, and I saw these reports. So I, the, the person who was doing this was a Pakistani. I said, are there any statisticians left in Pakistan? He said, why? I thought they should have all died of a heart attack after seeing this, you know, 500 million by 2050, which means 
the whole idea of providing them with education, providing them with housing, providing them with jobs once they finish schooling, that is a huge challenge. So Pakistan will soon, is currently the fifth biggest country in terms of population. After China, India, US, Indonesia, then you have Pakistan five, very soon it will be third after India, China, and then Pakistan, it will overtake the US. The US is not going to reach 500 million by 2050. Uh, so so the, that is a huge challenge. Now what happens with these human resources is that, yes, you have lots of people, and because there is a, a very high degree of poverty, which means that we can continue to provide cheap labor and remain globally competitive, so it becomes an asset. But you also produce a lot. India and China individually produce more engineers, more doctors, more MBAs than the rest of the world combined. Which means that if you take total number of engineers, one third are from China, one third are from India, one third are from the rest of the world put together, all of Europe, and, uh, and America. The only area where America beats these two countries are in the production of MBAs. And they are catching up fast. So there are human resources which are, are but then there, there is a, what do you call it, the dark side of the population, because it's a problem too. Population means health issues, challenges, providing housing, and the density of population is so high. And right now, with 1.2 billion people, the US, India, India is one third the size of US. Geographically speaking, the US is three times the size of India, and India's population is four times the size of the US. So India, in terms of density, is 12 times the US density in terms of population. And that is a huge challenge as to how, how can we continue to, to provide them with necessary welfare. They will continue to be a nation where brain drain will continue. No matter how much the economy explodes, it will not be able to provide adequate and full employment to these billions of people. So in terms of, just as human resources is an asset, it's also a liability. There are some other resources. They have lots of natural resources. They are strategically located. The oceans, the mountains, uh, the key to the oil, the gateways for Russia, for example, uh, Central Asia, etc. These are geographically located. They also have a very interesting system of education, which is very inexpensive, but very effective. I became an engineer in electronics, spending $45 a year. So I just spent $180 and went to one of the better engineering schools. I spent $400 and went to the third best business school in India. So, for example, if I had gone into MBA at the University of Delaware or University of Maryland College Park, they were not as good as the business school that I went to in India. And did it all in $400 in two years. So it's an incredibly inexpensive way of providing education and then these people come here and uh, get jobs here as engineers and doctors, etc., etc. So, so it's, it's to me so fascinating as to how big a bank you get from one education dollar in India. So that is a, a fascinating aspect of it. So it's a tremendous, tremendous asset uh, in Delaware. We spend thirteen thousand dollars a year per kid. And by the time they come to the University of Delaware, the first thing I do every year is to check who can read and write. Literally, I do a reading writing test for freshmen. After that, we have spent what one hundred and thirty plus twenty six hundred and fifty six thousand dollars in twelve years for these kids to, and I'm testing them in their own language. It's not a foreign language test that I'm conducting. So it's, it's very sad. $156,000, you can start a liberal arts college in India and produce PhDs in the same amount of time. So this is a very tremendous asset uh, which these countries have managed to leverage uh, very well. Like, in, like tiny Pakistan probably has 300 doctors in Delaware alone, I think, from Pakistan. I could name at least 100. How many, how many do you think there are? 300 at least in Pakistan alone? Yeah. And so, so they're able to leverage this, uh, and the education is good enough for them to pass the exams and work in the U.S. Uh, the culture is rich, uh, but then there are these challenges. They have poverty, they have diversity, there's a lot of political violence, terrorism is rampant, all kinds of violence. It's not just limited to what we hear in the news about Pakistan. Violence in India, with borders, communal riots, violence in Sri Lanka, Suicide bombing was invented in Sri Lanka. So 
people, and, 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 and it does a lot of damage. It's not just, it's not killing people, it's destroying the infrastructure of the country. It dampens the spirit of enthusiasm. My father worked in the Middle East, and made lots of money. It never, never occurred to me to invest that money and start some kind of business in India and make millions because I was so paranoid that a mom would come and burn my business down and nobody would do anything even if I filmed everybody. I have photographs on my website of people murdering people. And they haven't been arrested yet and I've had them for eight years. I've contacted governments in India and so on. So there is violence is, is a huge factor. It dampens local people from investing in their businesses. It dampens foreigners from sending uh, money back home to start businesses, etc., etc. For example, one of the biggest assets these countries have is the global diaspora. There's not a place in the world that you won't find an Indian or a Pakistan. In 1998, in the elections of South Dakota, the senator for South Dakota, well, I forget his name. Tom Gershom? No, he was defeated by Pakistanis. You know, he had come up with an amendment and he had frozen Pakistani money that Pakistani wanted to buy an F-16. So the diasporas are immediate. What the point I'm trying to make was that Pakistanis were sufficiently influential in 1998 to defeat a senator in the U.S. because they didn't like his politics in Washington. And uh, last year, when Hillary was refusing to give up the primary, if you remember, there were people who, who wrote letters to, to the donors of Hillary Clinton, the top 20 donors of Hillary Clinton wrote a letter to Washington Post saying, let the battle continue and let, don't demand that Hillary should back off. Take a look at that list and you'll find that five of them are Indians. So the top 20 donors for Hillary Clinton, five of them were Indians. So there's a lot of political influence. So this diaspora can be leveraged much, much better uh, to develop these countries, but the, the members of the diaspora are afraid to go back and reinvest because of lack of security and violence. I had a Pakistani friend who built a mosque in Karachi and used to fund it for 20 years. He was a very busy doctor. He went there after 20 years. This was in 2003, and the imam was giving a khutbah, <laughs> wishing that God would devastate New York. And he said, oh my God, and I've been funding these institutions and all the relevant, you know, mosque is not just a mosque, it has a mother's side, it has an orphanage, etc. And he pulled all his funding because he said, if I can't supervise it, which he could not. And so he, and he's a very good friend of mine now, he stopped investing back home, etc. The same with India too. Hotmail was invented by an Indian, and that guy who came up with Hotmail, he changed the laws both here in the US and in India. And now Indians can donate money to academic institutions in India and they are tax free. Because this guy sold Hotmail for $400 million and gave $300 million to his engineering college, Alma Mater, uh, IIT Delhi. But before that, he spent enough money in Washington to change the laws. But this was